Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, today we will uh, talk about uh, clinical aspects of neoplasia. This is the last uh, session in this uh, series of uh, neoplasia. Uh, till now we have studied um, uh, what is cancer, cancer is a genetic disease, the various um, hallmarks of cancer which is um, stimulation of growth uh, signals, inhibition of growth suppression. Uh, because of tumor suppressor gene inactivation. Then we have studied uh, invasion and metastasis, we have studied about angiogenesis, we have also talked about immunity or immune surveillance in cancer, we have uh, talked about uh, carcinogenesis, viral carcinogenesis, chemical carcinogenesis and um, uh, today we will try to put it all together and um, see what is really, what really happens to the patient um, uh, uh, who has cancer. So, this, has, this, is, this, this session is about the clinical aspects of neoplasia. Okay, now why is cancer such a, a difficult disease? Why does it cause so much morbidity, so much suffering to the patient? This could be due to various factors, the very nature of uh, cancer which is its location and the infiltration to adjacent structures. Now, size is not the only thing that really matters in cancer, although size has a bearing on the stage. Sometimes even very small tumors, if they are located in very strategic locations, can cause huge amounts of problems. And for example, a pituitary adenoma. Now, it is only a benign tumor, but then it can impinge upon very important structures and cause all kinds of problems. A small uh, carcinoma in the bile duct, it may be very small, less than 1 centimeter, but still since it can obstruct the bile duct, it can cause huge amounts of problem for the patients like obstructive jaundice and so on. So, this property of uh, cancer, uh, its ability to infiltrate the adjacent structures and the location cause a lot of problems. Sometimes the functional activities of the neoplasm cause problems. Um, the, uh, there may be tumors that secrete hormones, uh, the pancreatic uh, insulinomas for instance, they secrete huge amounts of insulin. Um, clinically, there may be benign tumors, but then um, they can, because they secrete these hormones, they can cause profound hypoglycemia in patients. So, the functional activity of the tumor can cause problems. There are what are known as paraneoplastic syndromes, we will come to that. These are some syndromes uh, that are peculiar to uh, tumors um, that can cause, you know, they are not immediately, you cannot explain them by the location or the activity of the original tissue. Um, we will go into the, some detail in, a, in the subsequent slides about paraneoplastic syndromes. Sometimes tumor cause problems uh, because of bleeding and infection. Suppose it is uh, the lung, if the tumor erodes into the bronchus, it can cause uh, huge amounts or into a blood vessel, it can cause a lot of bleeding, it can cause hemoptysis. It, tumors can cause problems because they can get infected, um, uh, leukemias can cause um, uh, massive suppression of uh, normal bone marrow cells, so patients are more prone for all kinds of infections. So, this may be one of the effects of cancers. Some tumors can rupture, they can infarct and cause problems, they can obstruct, colonic cancers can obstruct and uh, the patient can go in for intestinal obstruction. So, these are some of the effects of uh, cancers. And also there are some other effects like such as cachexia and wasting, uh, which now we know are due to a lot of 
chemokines, cytokines that the cancer cells produce. Now, what are paraneoplastic syndromes? These are peculiar to neoplasia, wherein you have symptom complexes that cannot be explained by the local or distant spread of tumor or by elaboration of hormones indigenous to the tissue. Now, let me give you an example. The example, uh, classical example is lung cancer or squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. This causes hypercalcemia, Cushing syndrome. Now, the lung is not the site for either um, uh, 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 elaboration of ACTH or um, any of the cortisols, but the lung cancerous tissue will start producing uh, uh, steroid hormones, which leads to Cushing syndrome. So, now these are some of the effects uh, what are known as paraneoplastic syndromes. These are seen in about 10 to 15 percent of uh, cancer patients. And sometimes there may be the earliest manifestation. The patient may present with Cushing syndrome, and we are trying to see the cause why why does this patient have Cushing syndrome? And you may pick up that there is a, a small lung tumor uh, in one of the lobes of his lung. Now, sometimes these syndromes can cause significant clinical illness because of their effects. Some of these hormones can have uh, profound effects on the uh, on the body and sometimes they may mimic metastasis. As I told uh, earlier, lung cancer is one of the prototype cancers which causes quite a few paraneoplastic syndromes, some of which I have listed here. It can secrete antidiuretic hormone, uh, which can cause hyponatremia or lowering of sodium levels in the blood. It can secrete ACTH, adrenocortical trophic hormone, which can cause Cushing syndrome. It can uh, secrete a parathormone uh, related peptide, which can cause hypercalcemia in patients with lung cancer. On the contrary, it can even secrete calcitonin, which can cause the opposite effect, which is hypocalcemia. It can uh, secrete gonadotrophins, which can cause gynecomastia and it can also secrete serotonin and bradykinin, which can cause carcinoid syndrome. So, these are all the different paraneoplastic syndromes that can occur in lung cancer. There are many cancers that cause paraneoplastic syndrome. I have just listed the ones that occur in lung cancer, because it is one of the common ones. Now, I also talked about cancer cachexia. Now, why does this happen? You can see that sometimes, the, especially during the terminal stages of cancer, the patients are really very wasted and uh, there is progressive loss of body, body fat and lean body mass. Now, this cannot be entirely uh, explained by the lower nutrition levels uh, of these patients. Um, it is now thought that these uh, profound uh, cachexic uh, symptoms are not just due to loss of nutrition, uh, they may be caused by certain factors such as tumor, tumor necrosis factor and other cytokines released by the cancer cells. And these patients suffer from extreme weakness, anorexia and anemia. We then move on to another very important aspect in uh, the, the management of cancer that is grading and staging of cancer. Now, grading and staging are two very important aspects of neoplasia. These are nothing but two methods we have to quantify the probable clinical aggressiveness of a tumor. Now, one of the most common questions a patient asks a doctor when he or she is diagnosed with cancer is, um, how, how will I do? What will be my prognosis? Now, will I be alive after two years? Now, some of these questions can be answered, not to the full extent, but at least one can sort of try and stratify patients' prognosis by grading and staging of cancers. Now, grade usually refers to the degree of differentiation within a cancer. And the grade is usually supplied by the pathologist. By grade, you mean how close do the cancer cells look to the original tissue. 
Now, suppose you have a, a, a lung a squamous cell carcinoma occurring in the lung. Now, we say it is a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma if it has all the uh, very defined features of squamous cells. You can still say they are squamoid cells, there are keratin pearls and so on and so forth. Now, if they look very undifferentiated, you really have to struggle to say it is a squamous cell carcinoma because there are not enough features of squamous cells. Then you say it is a, the grade is a higher grade or it is a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Now, the stage in contrast refers to the how much the cancer has grown within that organ and how much it has spread within the body. So, the stage refers to the size of the tumor or the T stage, the extent of spread to regional lymph nodes or the N stage and the presence or absence of distant metastasis which is the M stage. Now, one of the most important staging systems that is used in cancer is that of the TNM staging system of the American Joint uh, Organization of Cancer or the AJCC. American Joint Committee of Cancer or the AJCC. Now, the TNM staging involves a clinical staging that is provided by the clinician um, by his clinical examination and the radiological findings and a pathological staging that is provided by the pathologist once the organ is removed and given to the pathologist. The, for instance, it is a, if it is a, a carcinoma of the breast, the, the breast tumor is removed along with the lymph nodes of the axilla. The pathologist examines the breast tumor, gives the grade, gives the size and also says how many of the lymph nodes show metastasis. So, she provides the pathological stage, the pathological T stage and the pathological N stage of that particular cancer. So, this is what staging refers to. How, in, how is cancer diagnosed in the laboratory? Now, there are many ways in which a cancer patient is investigated. Uh, there is physical examination, then there are radiological uh, tests such as chest x-ray, endoscopy. Now, you have different scans such as CT scan, the PET scan and ultrasound examination so on and so forth. But as a pathologist, uh, what is the laboratory diagnosis that one offers in cancer? The foremost, the most important as a diagnosis of cancer is by morphology. By morphology, we mean how do the cancer cells look? What is the tissue that is sent to you show? So, the morphology or the, the appearance of the tissue will tell you whether it is cancerous or not and this information is provided by the pathologist. Now, to do this, the clinician may do a biopsy which is he may take a small piece of the tumor and send it to the pathological histopathological laboratory or he may uh, uh, remove the entire tumor what is known as an excision. We may just as an initial test do an FNAC or a fine needle aspiration cytology by which we mean a needle, a needle that you use for giving injections. Some a similar needle is used to uh, take out cells from the tumor and it is spread onto a slide and you give a cytological diagnosis based on that. You can um, analyze the fluids such as pleural fluid peritoneal fluid for malignant cells what is known as cytology of fluids. You may uh, get resection specimens. I already gave you an example of the breast resection specimens to the pathology lab and you will have to uh, make the diagnosis and also give the staging. Sometimes the doctors may ask you for a frozen section or an intraoperative diagnosis. Many times uh, a, a preoperative diagnosis may be doubtful or the surgeon might want to know whether he has actually removed the tumor tissue or not or he or she may want to know the status of the margins. So, for all these reasons a frozen section is asked for. Now, a frozen section is a kind of rapid diagnosis in the sense that the patient is still under the uh, OT, uh, when the patient is still in the OT and is under anesthesia whatever tissue that needs to be examined is sent by the surgeon, it is rapidly frozen 
and um, solidified to make sections and these sections are studied under the microscope to see features if there are any features of malignancy, if the margins are involved and so on and so forth. These decisions are then conveyed to the surgeon and then the surgeon based on our findings takes a decision on what further surgery he needs to do. For instance, if we uh, the pathologist says that a certain ovarian tumor that has been removed is cancerous, then the surgeon will go on to do additional lymph node dissection in the patient. So, it, it gives an immediate result to the surgeon so that he can proceed with the appropriate treatment in the same setting. Now, this is just an example to show you uh, some of the common specimens that we receive in the pathology lab. You see the grass specimen, there it is uh, uh, an excision of a breast lump that has been done and you see a, a white area there on the left upper side and that is an irregular growth that is seen. And you notice that the surgeon has removed a lot of normal tissue around it, the reason being uh, you have to give, when you do an excision, you have to give adequate margins around it, so that you have, you are sure that you have removed the entire tumor. And the pathologist then says whether the margins are involved or not. And one of the methods we use to do this is to ink the external surface and then study it under the, study the section under the microscope to see if the tumor cells have reached the ink or not. So, if it has reached the ink, that means the margin is involved, which means that there could be still tumor left behind in the patient. And if the tumor has not reached the ink, that means the margin is negative. And lo uh, in the lower uh, picture, you see um, the same uh, tumor, the microscopy, the irregular tumor cells that are infiltrating the stroma. So, now you know that this is a malignant tumor. The arrow also shows a nerve bundle which is infiltrated by tumor. This is an example of uh, a cytology, a cervical cytology. Now, cytology uh, for cervical cancer has emerged as a very important screening test and um, it can detect um, uh, very early lesions of uh, uh, cervical neoplasia, what is known as the uh, squamous intraepithelial lesions before they become invasive. So, this is a very important um, uh, screening test, but uh, this example shows uh, a full blown squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, as you see, those cells that you are seeing um, have very high nucleocytoplasmic ratio, they show pleomorphism and they are elongated and uh, show a dense uh, cytoplasm. These are squamous cell carcinoma cells that are diagnosed on cervical cytology. A very important technique, uh, morphological technique that has emerged over the last uh, two decades or so is what is known as immunohistochemistry. Now, immunohistochemistry is an additional tool that we use in pathology laboratories wherein we use antibodies to certain uh, antigens. Um, they may be present on the tumor cells. To these uh, immunohistochemistry is used for various reasons. They can accurately tell you what kind of tumor it is. Now, in this case, see this example. We have uh, used, uh, 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 they have used a cytokeratin immunostain and all the brown cells you are seeing are the positive cells. Now, because these are cytokeratin positive, in a, a cancerous tumor, it will tell you that this is an epithelial tumor. Now, sometimes the cells look so undifferentiated that it is impossible just to tell on a routinely stained section whether it is an epithelial tumor, whether it is a mesenchymal tumor, whether it is a melanoma, whether it is a lymphoma and so on and so forth. There are hundreds and kinds of tumors that need to be distinguished on morphology. So, IHC or immunohistochemistry has emerged as a very important tool because now we have hundreds of antibodies that can accurately tell us what kind of tumor uh, we are dealing with. Another very important use of immunohistochemistry has been for uh, receptor studies. Um, so, this is an example of a breast cancer which is estrogen receptor positive. As you can see, 
it is nuclear stain. Um, all the brown dots you are seeing are the nuclei of the cancer cells. They are positive for the estrogen receptor. Now, here immunohistochemistry is not being used for diagnosis. It is being used to predict uh, the response of these tumors to an anti-estrogen receptor drug. So, all breast cancers that are removed are now tested for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor by the use of immunohistochemistry because if they are positive, they can be treated by drugs which act against these receptors. So, immunohistochemistry not only aids in diagnosis, it also aids in uh, predicting response to drugs. In other words, it also aids in the management of patients. So, in other words, pathologists not just diagnose disease, they also predict prognosis for the patient and they also help in the management because they can tell you by looking at the tissue whether some tumors respond to certain drugs or not or some tumors uh, how they behave and so on and so forth. Now, there is another important test that can be used in cancers. This is a blood test, a serum tumor marker test, uh, because many uh, tumors secrete enzymes, hormones and antigens in, and into the blood. And uh, by measuring these substances, one can, uh, you know, use this for initial diagnosis the follow-up and response to therapy. These are especially useful in certain tumors such as germ cell tumors of the testis and the ovary and so on. The examples are uh, PSA in prostate cancer, which is not a germ cell tumor, but PSA is used um, uh, for, you know, uh, assessing response to th therapy. PSA was being used as a screening test for prostate cancer in the western countries. Now, no longer is it used for screening, but it gives a very valuable um, uh, idea on the tumor burden and once the tumor is treated uh, on the response to therapy and so on. Some other examples are uh, CA125 in ovarian cancer, human chorionic gonadotrophin in the germ cell tumors uh, uh, of the gonads. AFP or alpha fetoprotein in also in germ cell tumors and in hepatocellular carcinoma. What has emerged of late um, and very promising uh, is um, molecular diagnosis. Now, we already learnt that cancer is basically a genetic disease uh, in the sense that there are many genes that are uh, involved in uh, cancer either as translocations or as mutations uh, or as amplifications. So, we exploit this knowledge for us to be able to diagnose uh, uh, these tumors and I have given some examples here. The first is translocation studies. So, some tumors you have specific translocations such as Burkitt lymphoma, Ewing sarcoma, etc. So, you can use cytogenetic techniques such as fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH or you can use polymerase chain reaction to uh, look at these uh, or identify these translocations. Sometimes amplifications of certain genes such as HER2 in breast cancer will give us an idea of prognosis and also will also help in deciding uh, treatments because you have drugs which act against this HER2 molecule. Sometimes to assess minimal residual disease, uh, we can use uh, uh, molecular techniques such as PCR or polymerase chain reaction, especially we know, know that in chronic myeloid leukemia, you have a transcription, uh, uh, you have a translocation of the BCR ABL gene, the Philadelphia chromosome. So, if you can identify this uh, in even in a few cells, you know that there is minimal residual disease. So, you can exploit this knowledge to um, identify uh, minimal residual disease. You can use molecular techniques to diagnose hereditary predispositions. Suppose uh, you suspect that the uh, a lady might have the BRCA1 gene, um, uh, which will give her increased susceptibility to breast cancer. So, you can detect the mutation of, of this gene by using molecular techniques. 
Sometimes you may uh, require molecular techniques to make uh, therapeutic decisions regarding certain mutations. The most uh, glaring example of this is the EGFR mutation that occurs in adenocarcinoma of the lung. And if this mutation is present, one can treat these tumors using anti-EGFR uh, drugs. And uh, of late, a new technique called next generation sequencing is, has emerged, which rapidly allows you to sequence uh, uh, these uh, uh, DNA, DNA segments. So, you can very quickly say whether a certain mutation is present or not. Another technique, a very interesting uh, technique is what is known as the molecular profiling of tumors. Um, this is nothing but the analysis of a whole lot of genes in one go. You know, the, uh, the analysis of uh, 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 a certain, uh, the, almost the whole genome, what are known as omics, uh, the genomics. Um, and um, uh, this is, some tests are already available in the market wherein you can analyze the, the entire genome or part of the genome of interest. Uh, and this is do, done do using arrays, the DNA arrays, wherein uh, you can at a time analyze a whole lot of genes, whether they are overexpressed or not. And you can create a molecular signature for the cancer. So, some of these uh, tests have already been approved for uh, breast cancer, where you can analyze a set of genes and say whether they are overexpressed or not. And this information will help you to further uh, decide your treatment strategies for that patient. So, in summary, uh, in this session, we discussed the clinical aspects of neoplasia. Uh, why it causes the effects uh, on the patient that we see normally such as, um, uh, you know, the, its location causing problems, the bleeding, the obstruction, the infection that it causes, the cachexia, the paraneoplastic syndromes. We also discussed the grading and staging of cancer, grading being the level of differentiation and staging being the extent of tumor spread. We talked about the diagnosis of cancers, which is done through morphology, through serum markers and through molecular methods. And also, we talked about the molecular profiling, uh, which is sort of the future now of cancer diagnostics, the mutation analysis methods, the next generation sequencing, which are revolutionizing the way we uh, diagnose and treat cancers. Thank you.